the optics crisis on the border turns into a PR win for the Biden administration as new pictures allow them to go on the offense. I'm Leland Bitter. Good evening. Mark Twain, a great Missourian, said a lie can travel around the world and back again while the truth is lacing up its boots. That was all the way back in 1924, long before jet planes, cell phones, and Twitter. Twitter brings us to these photos. They show Border Patrol agents on horseback attempting to corral those coming across the border illegally. Beyond that, it's hard to tell much of exactly what is happening. But that didn't stop the Twitter mob from writing its own narrative, its own truth. Alan Ellison, a Democrat running for Senate in Florida, wrote, asylum seekers being hunted down like runaway slaves on a plantation by whip-cracking cowboys should make every decent American's blood boil. If it doesn't, you are what's wrong with America. And less than 24 hours later, both the Vice President and Secretary of Homeland Security were aghast. I want to say uh, that uh, the actions that we saw, the images that we saw, do not speak of the incredible uh, men and women of U.S. Customs and Border Protection or of the Department of Homeland Security as an institution. What I saw depicted about um, those individuals on horseback treating human beings the way they were is horrible. Mm. All right, what they saw versus what really happened. We're going to get to what really happened in a minute. In those same 24 hours, the narrative went from whip to whip-like cord to horse reins. The last one of those appears most accurate, and accuracy is what we value most here. So let's look at that same incident from a few different vantage points. On the left, one of the images that's made its way around the world and back, before the second image on the right came out showing the reins flying up, not even in the agent's hand, certainly not whipping anybody. In a narrative win for the Biden administration, the horse pictures replaced the pictures of those streaming across the Rio Grande River on national television. We're going to get to the politics and optics of this in a few minutes with Colby Hall and discuss why suddenly every Democrat cannot wait to talk about the situation on our southern border. But first, back to the pictures. What do they really show? What were the agents actually doing? DHS promises an immediate investigation, but we wanted a little more context on what was happening on the border yesterday as temperatures were in the low 90s under a strong Texas sun. For that, we bring in Brandon Judd, 22-year veteran of the Border Patrol and president of the union representing the agents that are seen uh, in the pictures. Good to see you, sir. We appreciate it, as always. Uh, all right, reasonable people could acknowledge that those pictures are bracing. Uh, any evidence that you have seen anywhere that the agents were whipping people or using their reins as whips? No, in fact, they are doing a thorough investigation right now as we speak. They're, they pulled those whips. They're going to do DNA tests on those whips. I guarantee that nothing is going to come back. They do. Border Patrol agents are trained to use those horses in a manner to try to keep people from going to certain locations. That's their training. And this training has happened under the Biden administration. So when Secretary Mayorkas comes on and he says anything negative about this, it was his agency that deployed those horses to that location. It was his agency that asked those agents to do exactly what they were doing, trying to stop people from crossing the border illegally. And and when you see that that one um, image of that that person with the red shirt and that agent that is uh, uh, swinging the uh, the rein, when anytime somebody gets close to the horse. We try to keep them away from the horse for their own safety. If they come too close to the horse, the horse could step on them. The horse could kick them, causing serious injury. So we have to use that the rain mm. to just sweep, to just um, underhandedly sweep it in the air, and that's it. That's all that happens. Those images, of course, are being portrayed as something that they're not. This is a legitimate law enforcement mission. This was a legitimate law okay, enforcement Brandon, effort I, to I understand. enforce the I, I just laws. Wanna, I want to try to understand this. It, it surprises a lot of people to see Border Patrol agents on horses. Why do you use them? 
oh, we use horses all the time because we can get to locations quicker on horses than what we could in foot, uh, on foot. Um, there's oftentimes locations where we don't have roads um, that horses allow us access. But in this case, that's, that's not the case at all. In this case, those horses were specifically deployed for a specific mission. And it just so happens that it's Secretary Mayorkas under his training, under the, the, the protocols of the training that these horses were operating under. Okay. Obviously, we're seeing withering criticism from the administration, from Democrats uh, across the board of, of what has happened uh, at the border. I'm wondering what that does to the morale of your agents who are overworked and certainly underpaid right now. Well, the other thing that, that everybody has to realize, these horses out there, they're between thousands of people. You've got some people that are entering from Mexico into the United States, and at their back, you've got thousands upon thousands of people that are sitting underneath a bridge that this administration caused. And so, of course, when the administration criticizes Border Patrol agents for doing their job, for trying to enforce the laws in the most humane um, manner as they possibly can, anytime that criticism criticism happens, it makes us wonder, why are we putting on a uniform? Mm. Why are we going out there to try to t protect the American public when we don't even have the administration that's behind us, when we do what's right? Well, Brandon, uh, this story's not going away at all. We appreciate you coming and talking to us. I know that under circumstances like this, sometimes it's difficult to decide to come out and speak, and uh, we always appreciate and respect that you're willing to. Thank you, Leland. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Good to see you. TV, and by extension, the national conversation is about narratives. Images drive narratives. This weekend, the White House hunkered down as images of 20,000 Haitians living in squalor below a Texas bridge ran on repeat. The pictures cut against every Biden narrative about the border. Immigrants were in far worse conditions than during the Trump administration. There was no plan to stop more from coming, nor a way to effectively screen people flowing across the border. The White House dispatched the DSH secretary to visit in a hastily arranged trip, but the border czar, Vice President Kamala Harris, was nowhere to be found. But then came the pictures we were just talking about, and the narrative changed. And the administration, along with Democrats overall, went from playing defense about those living under the bridge to offense over the horse pictures. Human beings should never be treated that way. And I'm deeply troubled about it. And I'll also be talking with Secretary Mayorkas today about it. Disturbing images at our border uh, should really make every single American skin crawl. Colby Hall is the founding editor at Mediaite, the Internet's premier site for reporting on the media and a producer for Dan Abrams' new show coming up soon to News Nation. Colby, uh, good to see you as always. Uh, wow, amazing how quickly the administration now wants to talk about the border, right? Well, it's not just the administration. It's a, it's, a, it's a couple of cable news networks who, frankly, largely ignored the problem at the border over the last two or three years. Uh, and, you know, suddenly there's, you know, wall-to-wall -wall coverage almost, uh, you know, on, on these images, which, by the way, are really ugly images. They're, they're, they're tough and harsh images. But guess what? Those individuals, those border agents have really tough and harsh and ugly jobs, and, and they're just doing their jobs. And so, yeah, of course, you know, I think there's also sort of a, an alliance between many border agents with the previous administration. And so, you know, there's a there's a sort of low level, subtle criticism of those individuals because perhaps they may have been more those individuals may have been more uh, in support of the past administration. But you know what? They're, we're getting some attention on the crisis, the humanitarian crisis on the border. So um, that's a good thing. We're looking at the pictures right now of the southern border in this camp with 20,000 uh, refugees, for lack of a better term. I've been in a lot of refugee camps uh, in my day, mostly in the Middle East. Uh, the conditions described there are just as bad, if not worse. What do you think would have happened if this camp had existed in the Trump administration? Uh, well, you know, obviously, I think there would have been... But in some ways, they did, I, they did, but to a much, much lesser degree. I think, you know, I think we would have seen a flipped story. Yeah. I think there, well, some networks would have sort of ignored it and sold it in a more sort of a charitable <laughs> narrative towards that administration. Others would have covered wall to wall. But, you know, the, the, the problem that I have is that all of these narratives that you correctly point out 
All they're focused on is the symptoms. What we're seeing at the border right now is a symptom of a much deeper problem that no one seems willing to try to tackle. And it's yeah. a difficult, it's a very complex one. And I'm not willing to, I'm not an expert on the border to tell you how to solve a complex problem, but let's at least try to address it. Yeah, well, addressing the problems is a lot easier normally than uh, complaining about it uh, or commenting on it, which is what happened last night. You guys flagged this clip. Take a listen to Chris Cuomo. I was taken aback uh, by a single image that should make you pay attention to a problem. This one. There's a lot here. Yeah, as an image, to me, it does smack of a bygone era of slavery. Boy, it's hard to imagine how that's helpful in anything other than driving outrage. Yeah, he's playing for clicks, as we would say on the internet. He's trying to play the dramatic card and, you know, he, he set that up well and he was showing some pathos. But at the end of that segment, he ended up def defending those agents and kind of making a similar argument that I did. And, and I will say the refugees, the, the situation of the Haitians is really tragic. They're, these are people that left a, a, a country under duress um, and, you know, are poor and tired and hungry, and they literally Kobe, are I only seeking got, I only got like 30 seconds, but most of these Haitians, you, you, you think they left during the earthquake or the coup three months ago. They left five years ago. They've been in South America for five years. That part of the story is not really getting told. They came here for economic reasons, not because they didn't have food in Haiti. Well, I, you know, we need to get into a conversation of what it means to seek refuge. I mean, okay. are they refugees and what it is to seek asylum? And that's, you know, getting to my solving the larger problem. Let's let's come up with some stricter definitions. Uh, the America that we knew that welcomed the, the, the poor and the huddled masses, if we don't want to be that anymore, then we need to make that decision. And that's, you know, that's a national discourse that we need to have. Well, uh, the discourse continues. Colby, thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll switch now to foreign policy. President Biden did live up to one campaign promise today. He returned things to normalcy. His U.N. General Assembly speech was boring and largely unremarkable. That, of course, stands in stark contrast to those of his predecessor, President Trump. Here is a sample from Mr. Biden today. We'll all suffer the consequences of our failure if we do not come together to address the urgent threats like COVID-19 and climate change or enduring threats like nuclear proliferation. We've ended 20 years of conflict in Afghanistan. And as we close this period of relentless war, we're opening a new era of relentless diplomacy. Unlike President Trump, where for better or worse, you always knew what he was saying, Mr. Biden's diplomatic prose sometimes required deciphering. For that, we bring in John Bolton, former U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., former National Security Advisor as well. Good to see you, sir. Uh, relentless war to relentless democracy. Do you have any idea what that means? No, and I'm not sure Joe Biden does either. Uh, I, I agree with, with you on this speech. This is uh, about as unremarkable uh, as I've heard from an American president at the UN in a long time. He didn't say anything really that was new and what you could maybe qualify as new uh, didn't really uh, mean anything. Uh, so uh, it was a uh, uh, it was a really poor performance, and, and that strikes me as significant. This is a huge opportunity for Biden uh, to address the world. Some presidents have looked at this as the chance to give a state of the world speech, and he gave a, uh, a 20 or 30 minutes of cliches. 20 or 30 minutes of cliches, but he did talk about a couple of issues. Uh, we did a word count through his speech. I uh, mentioned COVID nine times, climate 14 times, China zero times. How do they read that in Beijing? Well, he did get a reference into Xinjiang, which I, I guess may qualify for the uh, cultural genocide that the Chinese government is, uh, uh, is engaging in there. But it, it's a good example. In a way, it was a domestic speech. He, he knows COVID is on the minds of Americans, understandably, and, and he knows many people are concerned about climate change. But in terms of uh, addressing international problems uh, other than a passing reference to Afghanistan, a passing reference to nuclear proliferation, passing references to China's abuses and, and, and Russia's. Uh, really, a lot of these problems simply went by the boards. And uh, I think many people were waiting for the key parts of the speech and then suddenly found the speech was over. 
One part caught our eye as it related to you, the use of U.S. military power. Take a listen. U.S. military power must be our tool of last resort, not our first. And it should not be used as an answer to every problem we see around the world. Again, how do our adversaries see that? They say hallelujah. That's, that's, uh, that's exactly what they want to hear. And it's a bromide anyway. Of course, nobody looks for conflict. The, the point of having a strong military and capabilities that, uh, that we seek is for deterrence, to, to convince your adversaries that it will never be in their interest to use force against us or our friends or allies. So denigrating our own capabilities uh, really doesn't get him and he points with our adversaries and I think uh, confuses and worries our friends. Well, this I think you'd agree was in stark contrast to President Trump. Here uh, was the former president, your old boss, in 20, 2019. Take a listen. Wise leaders always put the good of their own people and their own country first. The future does not belong to globalists. The future belongs to patriots. We know how you feel about the former president. You wrote a book about it. But uh, is there value in being that direct? Uh, of course there is. Look, in, in, in America, straight talking is still seen as a virtue. And uh, again, with the spotlight of the world, not, nothing gets international coverage like this opening week of the UN General Assembly as a president uh, gives, has a chance to, to uh, speak to a lot of people around the world. Uh, and uh, the, the reaction in the General Assembly Hall isn't what you're looking for. It's the reaction internationally. George W. Bush used to talk about his speeches to the General Assembly as visits to the Wax Museum. But the, <laughs> the spotlight that you get, the eyes on him uh, around the world, it was a missed opportunity today. A visit to the Wax Museum. We'll leave it there, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. It's always good to Thanks see you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. Turns out nearly everything we've heard about Hunter Biden is true. What does this mean for the president who claims he knew nothing about his son's business dealings? Plus, the body found in Teton National Park over the weekend is the body of Gabby Petito. But where is her boyfriend? Gabby Petito's family says they're going to speak to the nation when their daughter's body returns home from Florida or to Florida. Today, the coroner in Jackson, Wyoming, released autopsy results confirming what seemed most likely. Somebody killed the 22-year-old and dumped her body in a national park. Jackson, Wyoming is roughly 2,000 miles from the Carlton Reserve, an alligator-infested swamp not far from where Gabby and her boyfriend lived. The boyfriend is on the run tonight, and police are searching the swamp. News Nation's Brian Enton has broken exclusive after exclusive on this story and joins us for where police have concluded the search for the night, but it still have everything cordoned off. Hi, Brian. Hey, Leland. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. It is pretty miserable out here. This is just a massive 24,000 acre swamp, bigger than Manhattan. Goes on and on as far as the eye can see. Pitch black out here tonight. You mentioned it. It's hot. Mosquitoes. There's alligators. There's snakes. You basically can't see anything right now. We're on one of the very uh, dry parts of this reserve, but 75% of this reserve uh, is covered by water, which is why this search for Brian Laundry, Gabby Petito's fiance, was so difficult today. We were up in a helicopter. They're basically using airboats and swamp buggies and ATVs and doing a grid search and trying to see if he is somewhere here hiding out, Leland. All right. For reference, uh, it's about the same size as Disney World, which was built on a swamp uh, in Florida. Huge, huge area. Brian, why do they think the boyfriend might be there? Or do we know? Well, that's a good, yeah, that's a good question. They think he might be here from what police have told us because Brian Laundrie's parents told them on Tuesday that he went for a hike here, that he left in his Mustang and came here for a hike. The big question, are the parents telling the truth? Police say they're still trying to corroborate the story. Huh. If the parents are not telling the truth, this has been a total waste of time and resources, and there have been hundreds of police officers out here searching for days. Yeah. You probably also have to wonder how the police let the boyfriend get away and slip away while they were still searching uh, for Gabby before finding uh, her body. Brian, 
Uh, keep up the great work. We'll see you later uh, in Prime with an update. Got it, Leland. Thanks. Right. Fantastic reporting. On to more great reporting. A new book confirms some of the most disturbing reporting about how Hunter Biden peddled his dad's role as vice president for hard cash and lucrative contracts. Here's how Politico reported on Brian Schechenberger's new book, The Bidens Inside the First Family's 50-Year Rise to Power. The book finds evidence that some of the purported Hunter Biden laptop material is genuine, including two emails at the center of last October's controversy. A person who had independent access to Hunter Biden's emails confirmed he did receive a 2015 email from a Ukrainian businessman thanking him for a chance to meet Joe Biden. Ben Schreckinger, the author of the new book, joins us now. You see the title and the cover right there. Ben's with us. Ben, appreciate it. Uh, out of all of your reporting, uh, is there a smoking gun? No. There are a number of concerns raised by my reporting about potential conflicts of interest, uh, <clears throat> business dealings of Hunter Biden and of other Biden relatives, uh, creating possibilities of avenues for undue influence. Uh, this is a pattern that really dates back to Joe Biden's first term in the Senate uh, and some controversy over some bank loans that his brother got back then uh, continues down uh, to even this summer with Hunter Biden's foray into painting. And so uh, this has been a theme of, of Biden's public career really from the start. Uh, and, and it's and documented. By, and by theme, you mean that he, enriching himself sort of this, this these sort of soft bribes, if you will, or favorable treatment because of, of his office? What I would say is that consistently uh, his relatives have engaged in business dealings with people who have an interest in influencing Joe Biden. Okay. Uh, and that at the highest levels of power, uh, even something that creates the appearance of a conflict of interest is a concern. Uh, and, and some of these business dealings do create at least that appearance. So, so this is very different than the working man Joe from Scranton image that the president, previously vice president, previously Senator Biden portrayed on the stump. I think it, it does complicate that image of Joe Biden. You know, he's at one point during the financial crisis uh, condemning cowboy capitalists in the hedge fund industry. At that time, Hunter Biden and his brother, Jim Biden, that's Joe's brother, Jim Biden, Hunter's uncle, uh, together were running a hedge fund called Paradigm uh, Global Management uh, that was at one point uh, running a fund with Alan Stanford, the notorious Ponzi schemer. There were a number mm -hmm. of other issues raised by that hedge fund foray. Uh, and that is something that, that is inconsistent, I think, with the folksy down-home image of Joe Biden that many people have. Yeah, the, the president, for his part, says, I don't know anything about this. Take a listen. Mr. Vice President, how many times have you ever spoken to your son about his overseas business dealings? I've never spoken to my son about his overseas business dealings. Does your reporting support that statement? Well, Joe Biden has made a number of statements to that effect on the campaign trail. At one point, he told my colleague Mark Caputo that he's never discussed his relatives' business dealings with anybody whatsoever. Uh, Tony Bobulinski has come forward and said, that's not true. I discussed uh, a CEFC, that's a Chinese oil company venture that I was planning to go into with Jim and Hunter Biden with Joe Biden in Los Angeles in 2017. Uh, Joe Biden's campaign, when, when Bobulinski came out and said that, issued a statement saying that he never considered going into business with his family members, but they didn't actually contest anything that Bob Yulinski said. And Bob Yulinski said that, that Joe Biden had discussed his family business, his family's business dealings, and that contradicts what Joe Biden has said. Ben, I'm going to say your last name for the third time, and I think I'm going to get it right this time. Ben Schreckinger, correct? You nailed it, Leland. That's there, right. Th there, we, there we go. Uh, great reporting, great work. Uh, for some reason, I think there's going to be more to talk about on this subject. We'll have you back. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. The Biden honeymoon is over. We're going to show you the policies behind new poll numbers that have President Biden below President Trump's numbers. But first, are progressives going to derail Biden's domestic agenda? Who really is in charge in D.C.? President Biden's problems are piling up at the same time the White House is trying to move forward with his domestic agenda. First, as we mentioned earlier, the chaos at our southern border. Today, we heard from Vice President Kamala Harris for the first time on the surge of Haitian migrants at the Texas border, saying she wants an investigation to allege mistreatment of migrants by border agents. 
This, as the DHS secretary today, could not even give a ballpark estimate of how many of those 1.3 million plus illegal aliens who crossed into the United States this year have been released into the United States. So we've got, well, again, 1.3 million people. How many people have been returned? How many people are being detained? How many people have been dispersed to all points around America? Uh, Senator, I would be pleased to provide you with that data. I want them now. Uh, Why don't you have that information now? And another setback for the White House is Democrats face a growing rift over their stalled $3.5 trillion spending package and are now racing against the clock to try and rescue the bipartisan infrastructure bill ahead of a deadline in the House to vote on it next week. Progressives are now threatening to sink everything unless all of the big spending bills are passed as well. And more troubles for President Biden ahead of next year's very high stakes midterms. A shocking new poll shows Biden's approval numbers have plunged a crucial swing state. He is now below President Trump's worst numbers. We're going to have a little bit more on that with Kristen Soltis Anderson in a couple of minutes. We alluded to this yesterday. President Biden's legacy is now on the line as Democrats are facing an inner party battle over these massive spending packages. Politico reporting today, Democrats fear Biden's domestic agenda could implode as progressives and moderates in the House are now accusing each other of holding the bipartisan infrastructure bill hostage. That's the $1 trillion bill. Progressives want the $3.5 trillion bill uh, as well. Let's bring in Pablo Manriquez, Capitol correspondent for Latino Rebels, who has some unique sourcing uh, inside the Progressive Caucus. Pablo, good to see you. All right. Uh, good to could see you, implode. Is Politico's language too strong? No, I think Politico's language is accurate. I think the progressives led by Pramila Jayapal today, the Progressive Caucus chair, are tired of playing second fiddle to Joe Manchin in the Senate. So in the House, Pramila Jayapal had meetings today with Nancy Pelosi that were reported to have been hours long. Hispanic Caucus senators uh, have had meetings with Charles Schumer's today also hours long talking about, you know, everything from prescription drug pricing to whether or not immigration can be included in this nebulous bill. So, yeah, I think that imploding is a pretty good answer right now. But it could be the case that it's imploding so that it can be rebuilt back again with progressive input, because I don't think that progressive input has really been taken seriously beyond the initial input that Bernie Sanders hmm. put into the bill when he helped draft it with Senate leadership. Yeah, he calls $3.5 trillion, uh, I think, a compromise, because he wanted 7 or $6 trillion. Uh, that's, that's correct. It, it seems as though you think that the squad, the progressives, have the upper hand over the White House on this. I think that they've seen how Joe Manchin and Christian Cinema have, have been able to become so politically powerful in the upper chamber, and now they're starting to mimic the same tactics, but uh, the same tactics of sort of saying, like, listen, we are going to start drawing lines in the sand about whether or not we support this bill. There isn't very much of a vote margin for Democrats, whether it's in the House or the Senate, to lose a vote. So if, if like, Chewy Garcia, the representative from Chicago, who says he won't vote for a reconciliation bill without an immigration component, if more people from the progressive component, uh, progressive caucus take that, uh, that stance, then the bill is dead. The bill is completely dead. So it goes from being Joe Manchin, who's constantly saying, listen, I want less spending. Yeah. I want a longer timeline on the bill to now progressive saying, well, okay, well, this is what we want. And it could to, it could also sink the bill. Yeah. Re Republicans have got to love this infighting because they can just step back and, and watch it happen. Where's Joe Biden in all of this? He was the, the dean of the Senate who was going to bring everybody together, and it doesn't seem as though he can even bring his own party together. I don't think that Joe Biden has a really deep background with progressives, though. I think that Joe Biden has always tried to strike to the center of what the Demo like the, the center of what the Democratic Party wants to do. Like, you know what I mean? So sort of like the, the, yeah, the he, medium he's, common denominator. He's the, president, he's the president of the United States. Air Force One makes a lot of noise when it shows up in town does just he just not have does. the ability does he not have the ability to twist arms or doesn't have the inclination or the desire? What is I it? I think, honestly, that's a really good question, Leland. I think that the COVID restrictions that limit the amount of access that people have to the White House means that you don't have the usual parties going in and out of the White House where people can sort of hobnob, determine what people's priorities are. You know what I mean? Like a lot of this stuff is going on over Zoom. It's going on through intermediaries, which whereas in the past, it would go on face to face over a beer, over a drink or something like that at the White House. Biden doesn't have the hosting abilities that previous presidents have had.
Yeah, fair, fair, fair point. And it seems as though phone calls from him at least haven't moved things very much. Uh, they have. I guess Biden the... does not know how to work the phone like some of his predecessors. I would say that that is a very astute uh, observation. Say, say that again. Biden does not know how to work the phone like some of his predecessors do. That's a very astute observation because he has not been effective at getting these people to a yes over the phone. So it's going to be I think it's going to be a lot more FaceTime. You're going to see a lot more progressives taking that trip down Pennsylvania Avenue to the White House for closed door meetings with the president in the next couple of weeks. Well, and Pablo, we know you're going to be there to uh, report on it. It certainly seems that Nancy Pelosi's uh, September 27th deadlines are going to slide. Fair? Fair. Absolutely right. fair. All right, Accurate. Pablo, Pablo, great reporting. Always good to see you, my friend. Thank you, Leland. Good to see you, too. Yeah, for sure. Well, there's some new polling that might explain a lot of the things Pablo was talking about. It finds support for President Biden plummeting to historic lows in the Midwest battleground state of Iowa. The Des Moines Register poll, considered the gold standard of polling, finds just 31 percent of Iowans approve of the job Joe Biden is doing as president. That's lower than former President Trump's worst score in Iowa of 35 percent in December of 2017. Biden's disapproval now stands at 62 percent in the first in the nation presidential caucus. Uh, Kristen Soltis Anderson, pollster, columnist for the Washington Examiner, joins us now. Uh, KSA, always good to see you. Uh, does these poll numbers explain what Pablo was saying, that Joe Biden just doesn't have the ability to arm twist up on Capitol Hill? It's much easier for presidents to get things done when there's a sense that they have some kind of coattails, when people want to be associated with him, when they think that having Joe Biden come visit their district is beneficial. At the moment, if you're a moderate Democrat, if you are, for instance, somebody who is in Iowa, you're looking at redistricting, you're wondering what you're going to do next, uh, suddenly Joe Biden is no longer the political advantage that you may be hoping he is, and these numbers just underscore that. All right, you talked that he doesn't have a lot of coattails with moderates. Uh, does he have a lot of coattails with progressives? Well, progressives aren't necessarily the ones who are worried about the midterm elections that are coming up. They're probably the ones that are in pretty safe districts. So for them, they're viewing this moment as the moment when they need to be able to get everything done. Um, that they're worried that the midterms might mean that their party's out of power and they're feeling frustrated. Why is our party not doing what we can? But at the same time, the Biden administration is now stuck because clearly the voters who are breaking away from Biden and are creating numbers like this Iowa poll, these are the voters in the middle, the ones who sort of gave him the benefit of the doubt. Even if they didn't vote for him, perhaps they thought, mm. you know, maybe he's going to do an okay job as president. And what they saw over the summer really undercut a lot of their positive assumptions about him. Yeah, it's what, it's what you pollsters call cross tabs. Biden approval by parties in Iowa, Republicans 95%, Democrats, 86 percent. Independents, which is the key number that you talked about, uh, 29, 62 against. Uh, back to this issue of certain parts of the Democratic Party tacking farther to the left. Uh, this is Chuck Schumer uh, talking about the border. Take a listen. We cannot continue these hateful and xenophobic Trump policies that disregard our refugee laws. We must allow asylum seekers to present their claims at our ports of entry and be afforded due process. That can't help the moderates that you were talking about. Well, immigration is a challenging issue because it divides the Democratic Party much more so these days than it divides the Republican Party. The Republican Party is pretty unified by saying we need to have a secure border. The level of border crossings and illegal immigration is out of control and we need to fix it. It used to be an issue that divided Republicans, but no longer. Now for Democrats, they are the ones right now where President Biden is the one in charge. There's only so long that you can continue to blame Donald Trump for the policies that your own administration is enforcing at the border and the fact that it's been on your watch that these border crossings have increased so much. So the Biden administration is doing things that if Trump was president would be generating enormous amounts of outrage, but that outrage is a little bit more muted. You're really only hearing it from the progressive Democrats right now. And I think they're viewing that as further frustration with the Biden administration and this current moment when they're saying, we're in charge, why are things not going the way that Democrats should want them to go? Yeah, pa Pablo, Pablo was pointing that out uh, just in terms of how, how thin the margins are. Uh, you talk about if these pictures had come during the Trump administration, the pictures of 20,000 people corralled under a bridge and porta potties overflowing in really horrible and awful uh, conditions. I, I guess we would think about it this way. 
does Democrats or should Democrats worry that progressives going so far to the left on immigration and basically saying everybody should be let in and let all these people under the bridge out and just let them come to America. Is there any Democrats who worry that that's going to hurt the moderates you were talking about? I think if you're a Democrat in Texas, you're particularly worried. Remember, Texas is one of those states where it was along the border that actually Donald Trump performed better in 2020 than he did in 2016. There was a belief that Will Hurd's district, a Repub former Republican member who has a, mem a district that sort of stretched around the El Paso area, that that was a district the Democrats were going to pick up in 2020. They didn't. Uh, that was one of the places where actually folks were looking and saying, mm -hmm. if someone's going to secure the border, it was going to be Trump and the Republicans. So if you're a Texas Democrat, knowing that redistricting is coming up, knowing that the congressional map's going to look a little different, it might be even harder for you to get reelected. An issue like this that's putting immigration and the border front and center is probably not one that is particularly favorable to you if you're a Texas Democrat. All right, real quick. Uh, so the candidacy of Beto O'Rourke, Democrat, thinking of running for, okay, you're, you're smiling and smirking. I think that says, says it all, right? Well, look, Beto O'Rourke's going to raise a ton of money because yeah. he remains, to an extent, a national Democratic celebrity, but he's got to translate national Democratic celebrity into votes. Um, and he, he actually did okay when he ran against Ted Cruz, but Ted Cruz still wound up beating him. And then he ran for president and that was a very unsuccessful run. So you only sort of get so many bites at the apple. And I think Beto O'Rourke would have to prove what's different about him this time that would make him more formidable in an election environment that's probably going to be less yeah. favorable to Democrats than it was in 2018 or 2020. Well, noteworthy, he tacked pretty far to the left to run for president compared to where, where, yeah. where he was running for Senate. Uh, Kristen, we're always uh, smarter uh, after we have have you on than before. Thank you. Thank you. All right. School board member in Virginia is facing calls for removal after she voted against a moment of silence honoring 9-11 victims. Why she says honoring victims is wrong and what the parents are going to do about it when we come back. You might say from the sublime to the absurd, the school board culture war continues in suburban DC. You may remember the chaos that erupted over critical race theory and a proposed transgender policy during the Loudoun County School Board meeting this summer. Now in nearby Fairfax County, there are calls to remove one school board member after she claimed a moment of silence to mark the anniversary of the 9-11 attacks would harm minorities. I vote against this today because our omission of these realities causes harm. We are elevating a traumatic event without sufficient cultural competence. The token phrasing around 9-11 is never forget. As a nation, we remember a jarring event, no doubt. But we choose to forget, as this resolution, resolution does, the fear, the ostracization, and the collective blame felt by Arab Americans, American Muslims, Sikhs and Hindus, and all brown or other individuals who have been mistaken for Muslims since that day. Hmm. That's Abrar Omesh, the only Muslim on the Fairfax County School Board. Last summer, she drew the ire of parents and conservative groups alike after telling graduating seniors to remember, quote, remember jihad in a commencement speech. Now, more than a dozen special interest groups are calling for her removal from the board. Imagine that. In the op-ed published Friday in the Fairfax County Times, the groups call for the board's 11 other members to censure her, strip her of all of her duties assigned by the board's chair, and terminate her other remaining responsibilities assigned by the board. Let's bring in Asra Nomani, reporter, author, and co-founder of the Muslim Reform Movement, as well as on the Coalition for the TJ, which advocates for increased diversity at one of the schools in Fairfax County. Uh, Asra, we said one of many groups calling for this woman uh, to resign or be censured. Uh, is there anybody supporting her? Oh my gosh, if you can believe it, there were activists from the Democratic Party who were trying to basically do a witch hunt on all of the groups that had signed this letter. I mean, we've got 16 groups, the American Hindu Coalition, the National Society for the Advancement of Black Americans, the Muslim Reform Movement, Chinese American Parents of Northern Virginia, every minority group that you could possibly think of, the Hisp Hispanics for STEM, folks who are ultimately human beings you know they don't identify by identity they identify by their humanity and that's what Abrar Omesh forgot she forgot in being a wound collector 
you know, listing all of her grievances that there was a great trauma that happened on 9-11. Yeah. And she can have every other day of the week to, you know, lay out her grievances. But this is a day to honor those victims and the first responders. And so, unfortunately, the Democratic activists support her because it's a 12-0 Democratic school board. And they are just, unfortunately, circling the wagons. And the school board has not responded to this letter. But parents are going to go to the school board, including me, uh, this Thursday night I'm on the wait list and for citizen participation and we're gonna speak up well you also have to wonder whether people are gonna start running for school board to replace her and replace some of the other members I, I wanted to get to this and you almost heard she decided that she didn't like a moment of silence for 9-11 and it sounded almost laughable it was so ridiculous to think that someone would oppose that but then you realize that she wrote or said in a speech remember a uh, jihad I thought violence in schools was bad. Oh, yeah, and you probably heard her saying that, you know, there had to be cultural competence and they had to remember the grievances of one minority group. But I am a Muslim. I am a woman of color. I am a mother of color. And I know humanity is more important than any grievances that, that I may have. And unfortunately, she fits into this category that is bigger than her. You know, this is not just about one individual. This is about a network from California to New York City and Virginia included that it's trying to hijack history, try to hijack our curriculum and our education system with their politics and their agenda. She's a 9-11 truth denier, and she should have absolutely nothing to do with the education system. And so I'm so proud of all these parents that are speaking up because that's all we have now with these institutions that are so stacked well, against if, us. If, we have our voices, and we have to keep speaking up. Yeah, if parents aren't going to speak up, who will? Because this is they decide what uh, our kids learn. Uh, Asra, thank you for being with us. Uh, we want you to let us know what happens on Thursday night at the school board, all right? Absolutely. I will live tweet it for all your viewers, and I will absolutely report back to you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. We all thought about it. This Walmart employee went and did it. The incredible goodbye she gave Walmart shoppers when we come back. It's something we've all thought about doing, maybe wanted to do at some point after dealing with terrible co-workers or an insufferable boss. But Walmart worker Beck, Beth McGrab, actually did it. She quit in a speech for the ages. Attention, Walmart shoppers and associates. My name is from Electronics. I've been working at Walmart for almost five years, and I can say that everyone here is overworked and underpaid. I'm tired of the constant gaslighting. This company treats their elderly associates like to our store manager. You're a pervert. And shame on y'all for treating your associates the way you do. I hope you don't speak to your families the way you speak to us. Manage it and this job. I quit. I, on the other hand, will be back here tomorrow night. Prime's next.